Hello. Welcome back to Green Lady Permaculture. I am hiding in my backyard from the sun. As you can see, it's very bright back there. Um, I am currently under my nectarine tree. It's nine o'clock in the morning and I'm waiting for the solar guy to come by. But I wanted to talk to you guys about a couple of things that a dear friend of mine brought up in a video of hers and I think I can expand upon it a little. Um, permaculture is site specific. My videos are specifically for Central Oregon and what I do here. There are a lot of viewers I have that are from different parts of the world that I get to talk to all the time. Some from Greece, um, Cyprus, um, uh, Arizona, Colorado, um, it, it, people over in, um, there's a, there's a lot of dry landscapes, but specifically when I am talking about my stuff here, I'm talking about my climate. And, um, I just want to make sure that people don't think that I'm trying to tell them that they need to do it the same way as me when they don't. People need to understand their locations and realize that permaculture cannot be cookie cuttered. Cookie cuttered. I don't know if that's a word. Anyway, um, but it can't be set into a cookie cutter. It's not a mold. It cannot, like landscaping, lawn, grass, boxwoods, blah, blah, blah. This is not landscaping. Landscaping can usually be done universally and it makes every town, neighborhood, and other such look the same. And, eh, eh. <laughs> um, that's my opinion. We don't have to like it. That's okay. I don't like landscaping. I find landscaping, typical suburbanite landscaping, boring and stagnant and stale. And I'm sorry. I am not a French noble from uh, the 1700s or, but anyway, I want to talk about people and their particular areas. What I think people should do is I think that they should look at Google Earth and I think they should look at a topical map of their area. And then I think they should look at their first and last frost dates. And then I think they should do a soil sample, but not a lab soil sample. I personally don't believe in lab soil samples when you're going to start. I think they're kind of pointless. I think that they don't measure the things that permaculturists need or want. So why pay the money to do it? Just get a jar of dirt. And I said dirt because dirt is dead soil is alive get a jar of dirt and fill it up with water and about halfway of dirt fill it top it off with water and then shake it and then set it out and leave it for 24 hours and just a dark quiet place and then come back and take a look at your jar and look at the way the layers have divided it's a really easy trick. You can find all sorts of stuff on it online, but I'll stick a picture of it right here. Um, and you're going to look at it to determine how much sand you have, how much clay you have, how much silt you have. Those sorts of things are going to give you the best idea. And then after that, grow some stuff. Find out what likes your type of soil and then grow it. Keep in mind, you will get weeds. Um, you will get native, plants, which some call weeds, <laughs> some don't. Um, and then, because a weed is only what you don't want in a particular spot. If you want it there, it's not a weed, but there are plants that people just consider weeds. So when you get that soil, um, you can determine what you need. Now I can tell you that most suburban areas are going to need humus um, and their top layer has been scraped away by the bulldozers that came in to lay down their house. Um, so it just depends on what you have and what's there and what was your original soil was like. I mean some of 
like me, I've got a ton of rock. I've got lava rocks for days and sand. Um, so look at what yours is and determine what can grow well there. Dormant plants are my favorite. I prefer to do bare root plants um, because they just seem to work much better and I can divide things that way. So do your soil test, determine what you want to do, what plant is going to work well for you. Like I said, comfrey works well for me as just a nit um, nutrient accumulator, a low plant that I can put in and I'm not really having to worry about it and I get harvests from it. That's pretty much the main one I started with that and berries. I love berries. I have to they do okay here, <laughs> but sometimes they develop like rocks if it's really, really dry. So that's one thing I, I am envious about with Angela. She can grow berries like nothing else. I love berries. Um, so that's what I try and grow a lot of. Uh, honey berries do well here too. Cannabis works really good here, but if I get an age restriction on this video just for saying that, I'm going to laugh and cry. Laugh, then cry. Because <sighs> I've gotten way too many of those recently. Anyway, so plants do well here. Um, it's just I had to feed my soil. I do what's called, well, some people call it chop and drop. I do chop and feed because I don't drop it. I chop it off um, and then I take it to the rabbits, the ducks, and the chickens they eat it and everything comes out of here i mean there is a few things that i don't feed to them um that i just throw on the ground out here like asparagus fronds if something breaks on this asparagus over here um like that yeah <laughs> um i throw the asparagus fronds on the ground because nothing should eat that same thing with the rhubarb but nothing should eat that um Every once in a while, I'll get like a red root, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, pokeweed, like a red pokeweed pop up, um, or deadly nightshade because the birds bring the seeds in. Um, every once in a while, I get things like that, and I just recognize it, and I have an app on my phone. Um, that if I don't recognize it, I look it up or I do a Google search on the photo and get an ID before I feed it to the animals. Um, but mostly they know. So I can just chop something out of the garden, throw it in there. And if they don't want to eat it, they won't eat it. Um, the ducks are not as smart. The chickens and the rabbits are smart. The ducks will eat anything I put in front of them. So I have to be more careful with them. Um, the ducks are kind of stupid, but that's okay. They're cute. Um, so yeah that all goes in there they gets fed to the rabbits the bunnies the ducks the chickens i said rabbits and bunnies two times anyway um it gets all taken in there and then i dig out their pens and i move it back in here and some of it i put in the pathways like the stuff that's in the duck area and the chicken area that goes in the pathways because that's hot fertilizer um, it's more nutrient rich. The rabbit fertilizer goes directly on the beds. So that works out well because those animals are already pinned separately. The rabbits are by themselves, even though some people keep rabbits, ducks, and chickens together. And people have said, why don't you keep them all together? There's too much issue right there, um, for me. And because of the fertilizer output, um, by keeping the ducks, and the chickens separate from the rabbits, I can determine where I move the fertilizer a lot easier. I just scoop from the rabbit pen, it goes into the beds. I scoop from the chickens and the ducks and it goes into the pathways. It works well. And then I just mulch the rabbits area um, with hay and straw. And then the ducks, they get bark. And the, dark, the ducks and the chickens get bark and then I get in free from chip drop when it comes in. Um, and I try and do four or five loads a year. And I'm talking small loads. Most of the, the guys that do stuff around here are small trucks, though I've had a couple of large trucks show up and that's daunting. Um, but we get through it. <laughs> We've stopped using our driveway mostly. <laughs>
because <laughs> that's where the bark goes. Um, either way, that's kind of how I'm doing the chop and drop or weed and feed. <laughs> but I don't want confusion with, you know, pesticides. Um, so that's how I'm doing that. And that's how I feed my soil. And I do the duck waters where I'm emptying the ponds. I put it in the pathways. Um, but it's all about your site and what works well for you and how you can set up your system. That's just how I set up my system. Um, and I hope to give a better idea once I get an aerial shot of everything. Um, but that's just how I set up my system. The fertilizer goes there, or the food goes there, the fertilizer comes back. It's just moving the stuff, that's all I do. And if there was a way that I could just have it where the rabbits, you know, everything came over here, but they were still in colony, that'd be great. I'm sure that I could rig something if I had them on cages. I've seen people where they get these big cages together, like hutch type things, and then they have like a tarp that catches all the poop and everything and moves it, which is, you know, really smart. Um, I just don't want to keep mine in cages. I find like that that's more work for feeding, more work for watering, and that's more daily work. I only have to do and move the bedding once every couple of months. I should do it soon, but I'm going to wait till that recent rain I had dries out because it's a little squishy in there. <laughs> but I just threw more hay on top. The rabbits can't feel it um, and it's not bothering them at all. So I just put more hay on top and then um, once it dries out a little bit more, I'm just going to scoop it all out into here when the weather gets a little nicer. Um, same thing with the, the ducks. When I empty their small pond, I just dump it into that area over there because it's a small pond. Um, it's just a little teeny, one of the small kiddie pools. Um, and I mostly use that because they were babies and it's easier for them to get in and out of that one. I'll probably only use that kiddie pool during the summer months um, and just leave the big one for winter because that won't freeze as readily. But besides that, it's all about, I keep going off on these tangents because Everything I do here is a tangent. It's all a system stacked on a system. Um, and it's all integrated. Everything is used together. So that's why I feel like sometimes my videos are a little disjointed. It's because I'm trying to explain an entire system when I should probably just be explaining one aspect of the system. Um, so once all of that comes from the rabbits uh, and goes into the beds then I just let the beds go to sleep for the winter um, I put some I have like a hair that keeps going in my ear there we go um, I put some um, seed like winter pea and barley and winter seed type thing in the beds during the winter but it gets really cold here um, and we regularly hit, well, we're, we're si zone 6B, so we hit negative 5, negative 10 um, on occasion. Rarely negative 10, but it gets cold, and it stays cold. Um, usually once a year, we'll get a day where we don't get above uh, 5 or 6, a couple of days here or there. We're not cold like, you know, North Dakota or anything. We get that cold here, so it, my garden does go to sleep. This this is not year-round like it would be in Florida. I wish it was. I would have so much less seasonal depression, but I can't. I, I can't move to Florida. No, I cannot be a Florida woman. No. <laughs> um, so basically, I'm going to stay living here because every place is just as bad as here. Every place is gonna have its problems and its benefits. My problems happen to be my short, short, short growing season and one of the reasons I focus on animals because I don't have that long of a season to grow vegetables. I don't have that long of a season to grow greens. I love it. I think this 
is one of the coolest things to be able to do. This is Buddy Dock or Sorrel. Um, but I just don't think it's fair to compare people's gardens um, because of all of those aspects. You can't just do apples to oranges. You have to go, apples aren't even indigenous. Orange aren't even indigenous. And one of them grows in one part of the United States and one of them grows in the other. So you can't, that's why you can't compare apples and oranges. My garden is not a Florida garden. Um, my garden is a central Oregon high altitude desert garden. Um, it will never be Angela's garden. It will never be Nax garden. It will never be Edible Acres garden or any of those channels I watch. Um, all of them all have their unique aspects. And feeding the soil is what they all do. But they all do it in their own ways. So find the, basically what I'm trying to tell you is find the system that works for you. Find your permaculture. Find what is gonna work in your area, in your region. Google Maps is your friend. Find your topical geographical maps. Find your areas where your wind's coming from, where your sun's coming from, where the rain is pooling. Do you have too much water? Do you have too little water? What do you have? That's the first questions anybody who wants to get into permaculture should ask themselves is what do you have? What is available to you? Use those resources, use what you have. What do you have an abundance of? I have mallow, I'm going to feed it to the rabbits. I have a dry climate with very little rain, so I can keep my rabbits without cover for most of the year. I don't have many aerial predators. I do get some, but I have tall trees. I can keep chickens and ducks as long as they have shelter. I have a busy street that keep deers and coyotes and things like that mostly away from my yard. What can you use to your advantage that would normally be something somebody would complain about? Either way, I hope that gives you guys something to think about. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, use what you have. Find your permaculture system and I will yak at you later. Bye.